cool. Yeah, I can't stand still, and they wanted me to stay here for like 30 minutes, so I'm not going to work. Um, I think I can speak French, right? <laughs> Bonjour. Um, let me... Okay. Ah, uh, well, you got to go back now. Okay, so there's a delay. Can you go back? Does anyone go back? So I keep pressing a red. Thank you. Okay, French now, right? For the ladies in the back. <laughs> you guys good? Yeah. Is it bon ce matin, j'ai une conversation avec euh This morning I was talking with the women who were doing the uh, simultaneous translation. They were asked, checking, what are the differences between certain terms that are very, very similar, like maître d'ouvrage and maître d'oeuvre? And I realized I hadn't lost any weight in the last year because it's such a small booth to stick into. And uh, I'll try and do better for next year. Really good. Um, très content d'être ici. So I'm very happy to be here. I haven't been here for a long time for professional reasons, I, I, and I don't come to Montreal often enough anyways. So if you don't know me, I'm sure many of you don't because I've been gone for a long time. For 12 years now, I've been working with a company called Renzo Piano Building Workshop. Does anyone, has anyone ever heard of this company? Aside from me? Okay, good. Two people out of what? <laughs> All the people here? Okay, that's great. I also have my own company called Data Shapes. Have any of you, do any of you know the data shape package? Well, that's us. And also, three years ago, we started a Revit user group in Paris, which is 150 people at all of our meetings, which is not bad. And recently, we started a Dynamo user group. So if you need to reach me, all my contact information is up on the screen, and uh, try and uh, hit the right button. So. I'm coming home here. That's what's sort of nice about today's session. Several years ago, when I had uh, no beard but a lot of hair on the top of my head, <laughs> see what Bim does to you? Anyhow, I was working for a company called The Mini Show. Does, does anyone, has anyone ever heard of this? Do you like them? All right. Good. Otherwise, I would leave. So I was in the Quebec City office with Mr. LeMay, and I left for the far off shores with a few stops along the way in different countries. And I ended up in Paris. It was totally by chance. I was in Paris to give a presentation for Autodesk. And we went to various offices with them, including one called Renzo Piano. And I couldn't resist. Don't you think these two guys look like each other? Well, Alain's barb is, beard is maybe a little longer, but he's a little younger. So my new boss, new, I mean, it's, it's, I've been working there for 12 years, is uh, Renzo. Uh, he's an Italian architect, and I'm very happy to tell you that he's in Vancouver today because we finally have projects in Canada. It's taken 12 years. There are 11 partners. We have two main offices, one in Paris, where we have 100 people, one in Genoa, and that's the photo that you see on the left. It's a wonderful office there. It's beautiful. You know, people go uh, jump in the Mediterranean Sea at lunch, you know, there are definite, uh, definite benefits. I mean, you know, everybody's clean, <laughs> it smells good. And uh, they won the Critica Prize, which is the Nobel Prize of uh, Architecture in 1999, without me, in other words. <laughs> and uh, they won basically every prize that you could win, even the Écart d'Argent, which is a France Architecture Prize, and it's the second time we've won it. And uh, you know, it's, it's great to work with this boss. We have uh, some famous projects. If you've ever been to Paris, I would hope that you've been to the Pompidou Center. Parisians either love it or hate it, but you, you can't remain indifferent. It's a big building where the, all of the internal mechanics of the building are colorful and then they're on the outside of the building. And it was built the year I was born. It's pretty ironic. In New York, New York Times, it was the first New York City skyscraper built after September the 11th. So, of course, it was a big issue because it wasn't a U.S. architect. Then there's the Quebec Courthouse, which we've just delivered. The first hearings took place, will take place next week. 
and my name is not on the list, which is also good news. And the Shard in London, there's only one such skyscraper in London, and you can see it from wherever you are, and practically from Paris. And today, it is still the highest building in Europe. The Whitney in New York. Have you been to New York City recently? Well, maybe you don't like New York if you haven't been there. Okay, great. Finally, somebody's gone. It's, you have to go there. Have you been to the Whitney? The Whitney was voted best museum in the U.S. a few weeks ago. So I'm convinced that nobody's heard of this one because I think it's one of the one best projects we've done. It's a foundation in Athens. And it has a national opera house and a, a national book center. No, it's a little bit far, but if you go to Athens, go there. It's open to the public. And then Columbia University, if you're in New York. This project began several years ago, and the agency did the master planning, and we have a, a, a whole block there. Is it okay? Everything's fine? I'm not going too fast for the interpreters? They were a little concerned I was going to speed talk my way through this today. So I have a quick question for you. The first person, aside from Precho, you're not allowed to answer. But the first person who raises your hand to tell me which project on this slide was done with BIM gets a copy of this book. It's a Columbia lithograph. No? Everything done in everything where BIM was used. First of all, you have to start by raising your hand. A little bit of discipline, please. Pietro, I told you you're not allowed to answer. The woman in the back? Wrong. Nice. But the Pompidou Center, that's really nice because, as I said, they built it the year I was born. So I find it very cool. So thanks. Sir? Good try. It was worth trying. I'm going to I'm going to leave here with with the book. You, sir? No. Not the shard. There are 3 on the screen. I just said there were 3. You weren't listening or should we ask the question in English? We have a winner. What the winner said could not be heard. <laughs> by the interpreters, unfortunately. So you'll come and collect your supplies. The answer is the Whitney, which is just open, it was not done with BIM at all. The New York Times, no, the Shard, uh, auto card, Pompidou Center, paper, pencil, and sweat. <laughs> so a little bit about our agency. It's, uh, you know, the first BIM project that they were obliged to do it with BIM, and they had to because that's what the client wanted, was Columbia University, and that began in 2006. I put the square footage up there in case you can't deal with meters. So we have uh, 90,000 square meters. That's a pretty big first project. One thing that's unusual about the agency is that whatever project we undertake, 90% of cases, there are always partnerships with local architects which means that we have a design team in Paris, in this case in New York City, so at Piano, but also a local architect. And there are members of that team uh, on one of our teams here in the room. So if you go back to 2006, we didn't have Revit, we didn't have Revit server. We had other solutions and uh, a lot more crap. The second project that we did was the foundation. Why? Because the foundation team saw what was happening in New York City. Giorgio said, I'd like us to do that. I'd like to forget about AutoCAD. So that was our second project. And the third one was the courthouse in Paris, because we had no choice. Again, the client was Bouig, and if you haven't heard of Bouig, well, they're basically the French equivalent of Pomerleau. Isn't that nice? Was that nice? I'm not sure culturally. Did I just uh, make a gaffe? Was that OK? Well, you be the judge. And this is an idea of what kind of projects we're involved in today. We have 35 projects, basically in every time zone in the world, which means that when I go to bed at night, if I don't turn my phone off, I can't sleep. And aside from two projects, everything is in BIM. There are only two projects in AutoCAD, and oh my god, do they suffer.
I think I'm okay for timing here. I'd like to say a few words about innovation and change because this is the theme of the day. I was trying to do things a bit differently from the way the rest of the day is going to go. I put up some definitions just so we could be clear. I think that it, you have to have innovation to have change and you can't have change if you don't have innovation. So this is what happens when we have a project. We start with the first draft. A client gives us a call. They come in to see Renzo and they say, well, I have this idea. In this case, this is the Monaco project, which is an extension into the sea because we all know that Monaco is so big, right? So they came to see Renzo to ask him to take care of the port section. So uh, he likes sailing and boats, so that was his inspiration. So he sat down with his pencil and he started to sketch. Because that's all he does. That is all. And then we have what we call the partners, people who've been there for 20, 25, 30, even 40 years. And then they decipher what he sketched and make something more workable out of it. So we started with the drawings of bits and pieces of a boat, and then we come up with a sort of blueprint. That's our signature at the agency. We have this for almost every project. And then we start getting the team organized because we still haven't identified the members of the team. We have Renzo who sketches, we have a partner who tries to uh, set it up a bit, and when it starts taking shape, we start to figure out who's going to be on the team. And then we start to do foam models. We sit down, we look at volumes, and we talk with Renzo. Then we go back to the drawing board. <laughs> because it's never perfect. I love Paolo. He's great, but I couldn't resist this one. I asked him if it was to scale, and I, I pushed my hand on his mouse. He was, that wasn't very nice. If he ever hears this, he'll kill me. <laughs> so the issue is, how do you get people who do this, who've done everything well in their lives, and we try to get them to change. How do we do this? Because frankly, if the industry wants to change but Renzo doesn't want to change, Renzo's not going to change. And, you know, he's got the status and, you know, he may not want to change, but people are still going to call him. They're going to, they're going to continue to deal with him. So the first thing that is the most important is to preach by example. So you want to explain that you want to do things differently. You can talk to people. They maybe will listen. But it's very important to actually show them what you're doing by doing it. It's not enough to talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. There's a second factor which is very important, which is education. Education doesn't mean sitting down around a table with a computer in front of you and training people. The first level of people that you have to educate are your close collaborators. A quick anecdote here. We went to Korea for a 600 meter, uh, we did a tower, uh, for a conical tower, and uh, unfortunately it didn't actually go forward, but there was Carolyn who was in charge of surfaces. And at the coffee machine, she ended up talking to the shard team people. And they said, how long did you take to calculate the surfaces on the shard whenever there was a change? So the project manager was William, and he said, what, three days when everything is working well? So Carolyn smiled and said, for me, it takes three hours. And William walked past, right after her, followed her right into her office to see how it was possible. So that's what we're talking about. We're not actually training, but that's a way of educating people, and it's the way that works the best. Then you have your project managers. <laughs> These are often people who have forgotten in this whole process. And that's unfortunate, because I could name names. Or these are people who are in charge of all kinds of things, including how to distribute work to architects or engineers. And if they don't know what's happening, they can't possibly do their job. And it becomes total chaos. So it's important to educate project managers, not to necessarily to use the tools, but at least to understand how it works, so how things are organized. And then, once you've cleaned up your backyard, you bring in the consultants. 
Now, let me tell you that regardless of whatever country you're going to be building in, you are going to be working with people who don't know what BIM is, who've never worked with BIM, and who think that AutoCAD is just the best thing since sliced bread. That's why I used to have hair, and I don't anymore. But you have to educate them, even just to make you feel good. And I would say from my experience, after I know that Renzo Piano, we have a lot of a particular status, but I've never seen a consultant come to me and say, no, we're not going to do this. Everybody has always said, OK, great, fine, sure, we'll do it, we'll give it a try. So if you're working in BIM, you have to have collaboration. So it's important to have these people do it. So our clients, finally, can be great. Are there, is there anyone here from Autodesk? <laughs> Caesar. Good to see you. So clients went to Autodesk. They got the presentations. They were told how great Revit was. And now we're saying you have to buy BIM 360. And then they come to see you, and they have these BIM execution plans that are so huge, and they're asking you to do 3 million things which give you nothing most of the time. They don't have the money to do all those things. And that's where education is so important. You have to educate these people. So getting back to what I was saying earlier, to get back to what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about examples, having concrete examples. I'm comparing two projects, both piano projects, two universities, both in France, exactly the same kind of documentation, exactly the same procedures. One in AutoCAD, that was before my time, and one in Revit. The surfaces are not the same. One is much bigger. So I, I converted everything into square meters. So all the figures are on square meter basis. So you're comparing apples to apples. Pro is one phase. It's a phase in France. There are 152 for the Amiens University and 500 for the ENS. You'll say, well, that's to be expected. Well, when it gets impressive, is that you have a 0 0.004 uh, sheets per square meter versus the double for a BIM project. Necessarily, I've got more information. Whether it's the right information or good information, that's a different story, but necessarily I will have much more information. So let's look at this proportionally. At the busiest time of each project, in Amiens, there were 20 people, and in ENS, there were 15. So I can extrapolate by saying that for those figures, we had 20% fewer people working, which is not insignificant, especially if you're in charge of the budget. Second finding. 1,549 files in AutoCAD, 39 in Revit. I was trying to, to change the proportionate size of the print here to give you an idea, but you know, you, you can't. You know, managing 39 files is much easier, it's much quicker, so therefore it's cheaper. What's funny is that actually the size, the total size, what I'm, what I'm talking about in terms of gigs is pretty similar. So I performed that exercise for all kinds of projects. Projects that were originally in AutoCAD, you know, museums, skyscrapers, and I end up with these figures consistently. So in our case, it means that with roughly 20% fewer staff, we can produce twice as much information. Well, this is necessarily value added. I haven't figured out how to cost it exactly to say, is it worth 15 euros per square meter? I, that I can't say, but definitely it's much better. Here are two examples. 
This is a small amphitheater in the university at Amiens. It's an AutoCAD project. And this is Revit. Back to AutoCAD, back to Revit. AutoCAD, Revit. Do I have to do it again or have you gotten it? Okay, I feel better. There's a quality because I've heard this many times. Oh, my designs don't look good. Oh, it's not pretty. It's, no, you just don't know how to use the tool. Here's the proof. Then there's a whole issue of communicating with companies, which is critical for us because we're designers. We don't have an extensive media tech where people will say, okay, here's the catalog, I want these elements. What's cool is that we're paid to design these things. What's less cool is that we have to then explain to the company how it is that we want to do this. And we ended up with digital models, which are much more eloquent than what I had before. Talking to users is another issue. People who are going to use the building. So this is a school. Most people, when when you give them a pile of papers or you give them, uh, uh, you point to things on a paper, nobody understands what things actually look like vertically. You know, oh, my office will be upstairs from the lab and the lab will be underneath me. But now we can prepare this kind of document very quickly so that communicating with users is much easier. And I have all kinds of examples of this. You know, we use Revit, of course. We're not going to hide that from you. It comes as no surprise to you. But you know that this takes two minutes. You put it on a sheet of paper, and everybody can understand it. BIM also computerizes all kinds of other things. And I'll tell you more later. But you could also automate things with AutoCAD, but the nature of the information, when you don't have that big database and it was inconsistent, meant that it was pretty complicated to do. And here, we can computerize so easily. Now that most people are doing this more or less, what does the future hold in store? What do we do next? I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming well, who is currently actively using virtual reality and uh, augmented reality in your projects? Raise your hands. Nobody? Are you just shy or? Well, there are things like virtual reality. It's, it doesn't cost anything. You can buy an Oculus for 500 euros. It's even cheaper in Canada. And you, you can use Enscape, press a button. Great, now I can walk around my project. Augmented reality or enhanced reality is a little more complicated because there's some processing behind it. We've integrated these tools some time ago, but the problem for me for a while has been the collaborative side. It's fine to walk around, but I'm walking around by myself. So we worked with people to come up with some solutions. We use things like at, uh, we have uh, RSVR Prospect. So several of us can be in a digital model in virtual reality, and we don't always have to be in the same room, which is great for us, because as we're working in Hanoi, Vietnam is very nice, but Paris to Vietnam is a pretty long trip. So today, we can have a meeting, and we've started to have that, this kind of meeting. So we walk around the building, we have conversations about a real scale model, and we're, we're not dealing with just plans. Likewise for augmented reality. Uh, finally, there's been a solution so that uh, Antoine Chaya, one of our partners, is in discussions with someone across the table, and I think that's ridiculous because he's pointing, and he's pointing at nothing. No, he's pointing to a scale model and in virtual reality or not augmented reality, and someone across the table is pointing to something else that doesn't exist. In other words, you can learn the whole thing in 10 minutes. You don't have to go see the modelers who will take how many days to prepare something that we could use to talk about. So these tools should be integrated into your practice today. Or maybe they already are, or I hope they will be soon. The next stage in the augmented virtual reality is this whole collaborative uh, circle. And then computational design. It's very in. I'm not sure how you say it in French, so I said I used Google, and they came up with this conception computationnelle in French. Don't know if it's the right term. Not sure I like it in French. But anyhow, it's a series of tools. It's existed for quite some time. People who are using Grasshopper here, anyone? Well, 
you know that computational design has existed for a long time in Grasshopper. And now we're starting to hear about it because Autodesk has funded Jan's work creating Dynamo. And contrary to Grasshopper, the source of information in Revit, which is a huge database, is used by people to automate all kinds of other things. So they're computerizing things that Revit doesn't do. Contrary to Grasshopper, which until recently was mainly concentrating on geometry. So just to tell you, the kind of geometrics you see up on top, which is the Hanoi project in Dynamo, I couldn't do it. We're not there yet, but we need this. So, you know, I had to tell Renzo, no, you can you, I'm, I'm not going to go say Dynamo, Dynamo can't do it, so please change your design. Ha ha, I'll have to change my job rather than that. So now you have to change your way of working. You have to think a bit. You have to be more methodical. For engineers, that's, that's something they're used to. It's pretty much innate, but for architects, it's a disaster. So we're making the change slowly but surely. We're trying to change this way of thinking. Now maybe you've heard of generative design. It's making some noise. Bentley's been using it for some time now. I have a good friend, uh, le left Autodesk recently, Anthony Hawk, started Black Arts Consulting. He's a very smart guy. I was going to make an Autodesk joke, but I'm not. Last week, he came up with a definition that I've tried to translate into French. But to me, I think it was the first intelligent definition of generative design. Basically, you have a tool in which you enter all the goals, all the constraints, and you ask the tool to find the solution. Are any of you familiar with Project Fractal? Project Fractal is an Autodesk project by which you can take all the parameters all of the constraints, and then have all the possible and impossible scenarios be shown to you. And then together with your brain, you can filter out the goals and come up with, at least I believe, and that's why we asked this question, I'm, I'm happy to have been able to talk to Anthony about it, and he agreed with me. We believe that this is the first, the first draft of generative design that everybody here can use. You can have a script, put it on Fractal, and use your, use your head. The next generation of generative design is going to be using artificial intelligence. So I'm going to put the same information and maybe other information in, and I'm going to ask the computer to understand things and to tell me what the ultimate solution is. And this is something that really strikes fear in the hearts of every architect. You know, they'll think, what am I good for? With this kind of a thing, <laughs> really, <laughs> well, it's not going to change anything, but the actual profession will change so much. Are you familiar with flux? When I got this, I thought I was going to cry. I thought it was an April Fool's joke. I called a guy called Thomas Kivos, and I said, "Are you serious?" And he said, "Yeah, we're going to shut down at the end of the uh, at the end of the month." I thought, "What?" It was a fabulous platform, but it's dead. I have had the good fortune. Yes, Caesar, I have authorization to show this. Autodesk is working on Autodesk Quantum. Have you ever heard of it? If you went to EU last year, you heard of it. There was a good presentation. It's a bit secret for the moment. The concept behind it, which I find very interesting, is, you know, today, there's this file transfer that drives me crazy. It takes forever. You need a bandwidth. And it's not always very successful. What was good about Flux is I would send in information that I could pull back out and continue working. Quantum is designed along the same lines. In other words, you can work with elements that are connected without necessarily having to go through the elements. So the idea is to find some sort of language which will enable everybody and now I know that they're building smart people who are going to say, yeah, but that's what EFC is. But we can talk about that later because we're not going to have enough time.
But the idea of the platform is this kind of collaboration. And I think it's really attractive because I won't have to transfer gigs and gigs of data. I could just transfer whatever elements are important, control points or whatnot. So keep an eye on it. It's a cool thing. And I am right on time. And since it's time for uh, the aperitif in Paris, uh, I'm still uh, on jet lag. So I think I'll head over to the bar. But a little announcement here. Kirk just joined us. The good news is that we have just won uh, the uh, competition for the new Toronto courthouse. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to be going to Toronto with Kirk. And I should uh, hopefully be coming back to Montreal more frequently than before, or at least to Canada. Thanks, and have a nice day.